rocky forest reporting for the news. On the other side of these doors is a courtroom, and the court case that's being heard in there is about someone who insulted somebody else and gone to court to get their retribution for having been insulted. They could have solved this earlier. The one who said the nasty words could have said sorry, but no, nope, they went to court. They didn't decide, they decided not to say they were sorry to not do it, and now they've gone to court, and who knows? They never know what's going to happen in court. See you in worship. Good morning on a very snowy morning. Our call to worship is printed. It will also be on the screen. I invite you to respond with the bold print. The Lord be with you. Christ is like a single body which has many parts. Therefore, the foot cannot say, nor can the ear say, the eye cannot say to the hand, nor can the head say to the feet, if one part of the body suffers, if one part of the body is praised, all of you are Christ's body. Let's join together and sing, Gather Us In.
Let us pray. God of grace, we do thank you that you have called us, gathered us by your voice and by your voice alone. Draw us ever deeper into yourself, we pray, that we together might symbolize what your body of Christ looks like in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our prayer of confession is printed. Um, It's also going to be on the screen. Let us pray this together in unison. Lord, you are a God who keeps promises. In our prayers and songs, we say we want to be Christians, but then we forget our promises. Our actions do not match up with our words. We say mean things to other people. We hurt their feelings. We think of ourselves first. And worst of all, we ignore you. Lord, forgive us and hear our prayer. For Jesus' sake, amen. Hear the good news. It was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Let's believe the good news that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven, transformed to begin again as the followers of Jesus Christ, remade in his grace and his love alone. Words of insult, names calling, things we wish people didn't say about us or that we may have said about other people. Sorry? Bossy? Bossy, okay. Idiot? Stupid? Stupid? I want to talk about stupid for a moment. So at nine o'clock, we had a list the kids gave me, and they didn't give me this one. Do you know why? They're not allowed to use it. Isn't that interesting? Other words, slow. There's another one I heard. Fat. Fat. Now, while we're on that, you know that this spelling of it is cool. Sorry. Worthless. So I tried out at 9 o'clock the little saying that we've all heard. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And I asked the kids whether that was true. And all of them said no. So why do we as adults use that line? Because we know it's not true, right? Words hurt. Words hurt. There's no two ways about it. The text we're about to read, or hear read, is challenges the same thing. Jesus challenges us that words matter. They really do. Let's pray. God of grace, we confess that we have not always used kind words. We are sorry. We also know that people have said unkind things, mean things about us, and they have hurt. Change us that we would speak kindly. Give us comfort that we are not the words others have spoken about us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. i
great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my living could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom 
such boundless grace the god of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken i am forgiven the king of kings calls me his own beautiful savior i'm yours forever and jesus christ my living hope and hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name Jesus Christ my Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then the morning that sealed the promise your very body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me Jesus your Our Bible reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 5, verses 21 through 26, then again picking up in 18, 21 through 22. But first, let us come to the Lord in a prayer of illumination. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for this, your holy inspired word. We ask you now to open our eyes that we might see our minds that we might perceive in our hearts that we might know the message that you have chosen for us today. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder. And whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable 
to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has said something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're on the way to court with him or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Moving down to Matthew 18. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. This is the word of the Lord. So this period of time from Christmas to Easter, we are going to be walking through the Gospel of Matthew. And I know all of you can remember back to four years ago when we last walked through the Gospel of Matthew with perfect clarity, right? So a bulk of what we did four years ago was look at the Beatitudes, the opening eight sentiments, statements that start what's called the Sermon on the Mount. Well, this time we're going to look more in detail at the Sermon on the Mount as we move towards Easter. The Sermon on the Mount is this block of material from chapter 5 to 7, which Jesus taught his disciples, those close to him, and he went up a mountain, up a hill, and began to teach them. So these words were not directed at making people come to faith in Jesus Christ. No, these were for the already committed, people who already had a sense that they wanted to follow this Jesus. What does that look like? And Matthew, his gospel, is yes, interested in having people come to faith in Jesus Christ, who isn't interested in that. But he's interested deeper than that in what does it mean to live the Christian life. Matthew is convinced, as all of the writers of the New Testament are, that it's not just enough to say, yes, I believe in Jesus, end story, that's it. No, it changes our lives. It's supposed to shape the way we live as people because we live in a world that's not the way Jesus would have us live. And what does it mean to live the Jesus way in the world in which we live? And the Sermon on the Mount has been talked about as being that countercultural reality, that description of Jesus gives us of what that life looks like. But we start with a section in the, book, in, the, in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is taking the Ten Commandments, some of them, and drilling down behind them to ask, so what's really going on in the command? The one today is where, where, the, commands, where the command is, thou shalt not murder, or thou, and if you do murder, you'll be liable to judgment. And Jesus pushes us deeper, and he says, I tell you, In fact, if you are angry with your brother or sister, you're liable to judgment. If you insult your brother or sister, you may be going to court. If you call your brother or sister a fool, you are in danger of hell. Strong, strong words. So let's back up to the first of the three he lays out here. When we lived in Winnipeg, Debbie got a letter inviting her to jury duty. Now, this particular trial, she did not get called. She was not part of the jury, but she heard enough about the case so that in case she had a conflict and knew one of the parties involved, she she could recuse herself from being on the jury. So the case was a case where a man in a drunken rage had killed his best friend. Hear anger blind rage that eats at us, that causes us sometimes to do horrific things. And even when it doesn't cause us to do that, sometimes the anger stays deep inside of us. In another place, the 
the Gospels say, don't let the sun go down on your anger. And we recognize that we may be angry, but we should not live with it, should not let it harbor in us, should not allow it to become bitterness in us, because that causes deep harm to us and to others. But Jesus goes further. He says, if you insult the other, if you insult the other. Now, the New Revised Standard doesn't give us the Aramaic word that Jesus uses because the Aramaic word raka is a very um, obscure term that the translators struggle with what it means. And various possible translations are nitwit, numbskull, which all sound very safe. But in our time and place, I think stupid is probably the best parallel we can find. A word of derision, a word that says the other side is worthless, unimportant. We have said that mentally they're not fit to be listened to when we call people those things. In fact, we have in a way depersoned them. Because Jesus is concerned not just that we keep people's lives safe. He is also concerned that people's personhoods be protected. And when we use words and names like stupid, worthless, etc., we are depersoning others. We are saying they have no value. We are, in fact, taking away their identity. But Jesus has a third one. He says, if you say you fool, you're in danger of the fires of hell. In biblical times, to say someone was a fool was, in fact, to say someone was morally bankrupt, that one had no moral integrity. In Proverbs, we are told, a fool says in their heart there is no God. And so that idea of that the fool is the one who says that there are no morals, is the picture that Jesus is using here when he says, when we then turn that around and use the word fool about others, when we say that other people are morally bankrupt, when we question their moral integrity in that way, naming them and calling them out, we are in fact throwing contempt at them. We are saying about this person that God has made that they are worthless, unimportant, lesser than ourselves. And Jesus says, that's dangerous. Deeply, deeply dangerous. These questions of contempt that lie behind the command, do not murder, has been heard by the church throughout time. Can I have the first slide, please? The Westminster divines, back in the 17th century, thought deeply about these things when they wrote the larger catechism. And in a section of the larger catechism, they worked through the Ten Commandments, asking two questions about each of the commandments. What does the commandment ask us to live like? And what does the commandment say we shouldn't do? So the first question on that side is, what are the duties required of the Sixth Commandment? The Sixth Commandment is, thou shalt not murder. And so don't worry, we don't have the whole answer, just the part that fits this morning. Can we have the next slide, please? The duties required in the Sixth Commandment are peaceable, mild, and courteous speeches and behavior. There's more, but we won't stop here for a moment. No, we can go back, thanks. So, the catechism recognizes that we will be in situations where we may be in conflict with another. But when we are in that place, will our speech, will the way we talk, be peaceable, mild, and courteous? Hmm. Hmm. Let's keep going. Next slide. Forbearance. Don't you love that word? Hard to do. Really, really hard to do. Readiness to be reconciled. That bitterness in us doesn't want to reconcile, does it? It wants to hold on. Hold on to that bitterness, that hate. Patient bearing and forgiving of injuries. 
and requiting good for evil. That's the pattern we are to live. Next slide. This is what we're not to do. So the sins that are forbidden by the Sixth Commandment. Next slide. The sins forbidden by the Sixth Commandment are sinful anger, hatred, envy, desire of revenge, and provoking words. I don't know about you, but I think social media is full of provoking, provoking words and deep desire for revenge. But that's not the only place we see it. We hear it when people say they're lesser than human beings. They're but animals. And I've heard that, those words used in the last six months about other people. They're but animals, therefore we can kill them. Now, Jesus is on to something here. But he would invite us to not use what he has just said to do what I've just done in the last paragraph and condemn other people. He would invite us to look at ourselves, to look at our own lives, to figure out where in our lives have we used the words of derision, of contempt about others. Because he goes on to say, if you've come to church, if you've come to temple, if you're in your daily devotions, if you're out walking, having a conversation with God, and it comes to mind of a place and a person that you insulted, that you derided, that you showed contempt towards, stop what you're doing and go deal with that. And then he says, come back. Come back to worship. Come back to the daily devotions. Come back to your walk with God, your, ta- your conversation with him. Jesus is saying two things here. First, he's saying this is serious business. We should do this well. We should do this seriously. It should be our first priority to be right with those around us. And if we have remembered places where we have spoken where we have treated others with contempt, we should go to them and confess what we have done. But the other thing he is saying is that our remembering often takes place in the context of being with God, of being face-to-face with Jesus Christ. Then the rush of our lives, we often blow by those things, don't think about them. They are sort of, um, we're sort of immune to remembering. But in the context of worship, in the context of daily devotions, in the context of simply being with Jesus face to face, we are confronted by what we have done and we turn to him and then turn to those others around us to, seek, to, to speak mercy to them. The slide that we have, that you'll see behind me and up there that's ahead of me, I think it is intriguing that it's a pile of stones upon which mercy is written. Because in the Bible, a pile of stones would mean, I'm going to start throwing them. But this is not a pile of stones we're going to start throwing. It's a pile of stones that calls us to mercy. To mercy to the other. To find the mercy that's offered to us in Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. To find the mercy that flows to us from him and to be transformed by that mercy in our lives. That the mercy that's flowed to us would flow through us to those around. That we would be so transformed, so changed by our interactions with Jesus, by the mercy that we have received the words we speak of others are words of grace and mercy. The actions and attitudes that we take towards others would be the same. It is not an easy road. Not an easy road at all. But we have the promise that the Holy Spirit will walk with us, help us, strengthen us, give us the resources that we need to live the Jesus way to live this pattern, to be known as being different than the world around us, to live deeply into the calling in our lives. 
to be the people of Jesus. The passage from Matthew chapter 18 reminds us of how long and hard this road is. Peter thought he was being generous. So chapter 18 of Matthew is instructions from Jesus about how to live in the church. And Jesus had just before the passage we heard read, had suggested that forgiveness was a good thing, which it is. And Peter, thinking that he was generous, said, so how many times should I forgive someone who has injured me, hurt me, harmed me? Seven times? Seven seemed like a reasonably large number, generous, magnanimous, And Jesus says, no, 77 times. I don't think there's an app out there for your phone that counts how many times you've forgiven someone. But maybe, maybe. But my hunch is is that there's no apps like that because 77 is just a ridiculous number, right? Who keeps track like that? Well, that was number 76. You got one more. You got one more. No, Jesus is saying, there is no end. Mercy flows. Mercy flows. Flows from the mercy we already have received in Jesus Christ. A mercy that changes us, flows through us to a world around. Thanks be to God for Jesus' mercy for us. May we be people of mercy in our world. Amen. Questions, comments, pushback. So, so, right. So, so, two things. So, so Jesus here is the, the the word he uses for anger here is that blind rage that I sort of described in the case, in the, in that blind rage that so overwhelms us that we're no longer thinking. But Jesus and the, and the gospel writers are cons- and the New Testament writers are consistent on this, that we should not let the sun go down on our anger. So we may be angry, anger will happen, but the question is what are we going to do with that anger in our lives? I'm going to use this illustration next week, but I'll use it, and so you're now, I'm now stealing from next week's sermon. Martin Luther, the great reformer Martin Luther, said this about temptation. You can't prevent the temptation from going through your head, but you can ask whether or not you will dwell on that temptation. And his example was, you can't prevent the birds from flying over your head, but you can stop them from making a nest in your hair. In other words, on this in terms of anger, we can choose to let the anger say, yes, I'm angry, I admit that, but I will not dwell on it, I will move on. Or I can choose to harbor it, feed it, nurture it, and becomes a grudge, bitterness, contempt. And so the instructions, the biblical instructions to not let the sun go down on our anger says, deal with it today. Does that help? Kim. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and the challenge, the challenge to, to the translators is the Greek, because the way the Greek order is, can be 77 times or 70 times 7 because the, the sentence structure is not particularly clear. It's just a very big number. John. When Jesus entered the temple Um, I, I want to do two things. I, I, okay, this is duck and weave, okay? There is such a thing as holy anger. And I think that holy anger does have a place. But I think that that kind of anger does not become deeply rooted in our lives 
and affect the way in which we see other people. That I may express my anger, but is that anger that I'm expressing being directed at an individual? Or is it being directed at something else? So again, I realize I'm, I'm walking a very narrow line here. I do think that there is a place to say that what is taking place in Myanmar is wrong on every single front. I'm just choosing a place. And that it would be legitimate to have a holy anger about that. But to turn around and say that the military who are guilty in this case are worthless, are worthy of contempt, I think is not where we can go. Do you understand that, that, that I'm trying to draw a line here? Their actions are deplorable. But we should not deperson them in our challenge to them. So I think that what Jesus is doing is he's clearing the temple as a demonstrated sign of what he wants worship to look like. But I don't think he is being contemptuous of those whose businesses he is wrecking. Now, they probably thought he was, but... We're going to sing a hymn that may be new to many of you. Um, Forgive our sins as we forgive. Let's pray. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. We come before you this morning, Lord, and we give thanks for the many ways that you have guided formed and blessed us. This world, though it often seems too cold and dreary, is the work of your mighty and creative hand. It is full of your beauty and truth. It reminds us that you are here in our midst, that you care for the insignificant and unseen, the hidden matters of our hearts. You are so good to us. And so we give thanks. We give thanks for this church, this body of believers that you have called together. 
Thank you for the stories that fill this room, stories of your grace and mercy and love. Love and grace and mercy that has been experienced in the lives of our friends and family. Lord, stories of your goodness to us fill this place. Remind us not only to tell our stories to one another, but to listen, to hear that you are at work in the lives of our neighbors, to remember that you are not far off, but you draw near and meet us here in our daily lives. We thank you for the heart this congregation has that you have given us for, the, for those who are outside our walls. Thank you for the many opportunities you have blessed us with to build relationships with believers outside of our own church community, both near and far, and with people who, as of yet, may not be part of the, the family of faith. We thank you for the many avenues, missions work, community service, personal relationships. We think especially this morning of the hearts team, the leadership here, both here and in Haiti. Would you continue to bless them, Lord? Guide them as they move forward in their mission to serve and help the people in Haiti. We thank you also for Pastor Melvin and the church that he serves in El Salvador. We pray that you would continue to guide them, Lord. Give them wisdom. Give them courage. Strengthen them. Give them love to one another, love for one another, so that they may be a witness of your love for us to the world around them. We lift up those in our own family who may be sick or suffering in sorrow. Lord, we know that you are close to the brokenhearted. You are close to the hurting. So we ask for your helping hand in the lives of those who are suffering. Be present with them. Give them your comfort and healing, Lord. You are a God who heals, and so we ask for that. Give, them, give wisdom and guidance to those who are working with medical professionals and others who are helping those who are suffering. Lord, bring comfort and peace where there is fear and anxiety. And Lord, we know that though this world is your world, your good world that you have made, that bears witness to your glory, it is a broken world because we have turned away and brought brokenness into it. There are many needs that we could bring before you. We think especially this morning of wars and conflicts, things that disrupt and dehumanize people all around the world. Lord, they rage on and for many of them, and it doesn't seem to be an end in sight. We think of the war in Ukraine, in Gaza, the escalating situation in Yemen, Sudan, Myanmar. Lord, we don't know why these things are happening. We feel out of control. Help us to trust in you and pray for your peace to win the hearts and minds of those involved. In this time of silence, we bring our prayers and requests before you, knowing that you hear us. We pray all of these things in the strong name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Extend a warm welcome to all who worship with us. It's good to celebrate God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You'll find some announcements in the inserts in your bulletin. I'll start with the two colored inserts. So we have a children's program starting, so it's a PA day on January the 26th. And so there'll be a children's program here at the church. There's a green insert about that. So let people know around you. And then the yellow insert is about the Grief Share program, which will be beginning on February the 5th. A couple other things are coming up in the future. Um, the Ministerial Association here in Center Wellington is holding a service in the Week of Prayer for Christianity. that will be taking place on Tuesday, January the 23rd at the Wellington County Museum. Um, so congregations, churches from around Center Wellington are being involved. And if you want more details, um, you can contact me. The other announcements are there for your perusal. I hope you'll take the inserts and take them and read the, insert, uh, the announcements. Our tithes and offerings will now be received. Let us pray. God of grace, take these gifts that we return to you, that all the world might know your mercy and grace shown to us in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's join together in singing number 562, Be Thou My Vision.
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be now and forevermore. Amen.